Our second lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Luke in the 19th chapter. Listen again for the word of God. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, for he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. These readings are God's word to us. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I've always liked the story of Zacchaeus. Maybe it's the idea of him being up in the tree that captured my imagination as a child. Or maybe it's because by being noticed, Zacchaeus turns a situation of being ostracized into one of social gain. Tax collectors were hated because they tended to charge too much and because they represented Rome, the occupying power. But these barriers don't stop Jesus. In fact, he acts on their account and chooses to dine with, at Zacchaeus' home. Maybe I've liked the story because the encounter with Jesus transforms Zacchaeus. It's a story about a tax collector turned good. He recognizes the truth of his wealth and pledges to make amends, to restore resources to his neighbors. So for a whole host of reasons, I like this story of the little man in the tree. His life is turned around by a good view. He has, in effect, a room with a view. Now, some of you may remember a movie called A Room with a View. It was spearheaded by pr producers Merchants and Ivory. They did a number of period films a little while back. This particular film is set at the turn of the 20th century, and it features a young English woman who travels to Florence, Italy with her chaperone. They have requested a room with a view at the pension where they will stay. But when they get there, that room has been given to someone else, a young man and his father. The two men insist that the women must take the room, and the women refuse quite properly. And after the proper sort of persuading, you must have it. No, 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 we couldn't. Oh, but you must. The women finally take the room. And thus is forged the opportunity for a relationship between the two young people that will prove irresistible. Zacchaeus also has a room with a view that provides an opportunity for an irresistible relationship. He is so transformed by his encounter with Jesus that he is able to give sacrificially of himself. He is no longer measured by others' preoccupations of him or preconceptions or by his own possessions. He knows himself now to be loved and valued as a child of God, 
who has a place among all God's children. Jesus says it well. Today, salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. Zacchaeus demonstrates his transformation by declaring up front how he will participate in the health of his community. Look, half my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. That's a lot. That's an awful lot. A fourfold re return to anyone who is wronged is going to add up. And half of his possessions, that's way more than a 10% tithe, or 5%, or 3%, or loose change on occasion. Zacchaeus doesn't receive a pledge card in the mail and set it aside to think about when the time seems right. No, he is gripped by the spirit of Jesus right then and there. And when he looks into the eyes of love, his eyes are opened to a new view of himself and of those around him. He realizes that because much has been given to him, he needs to give much back. And he reaches for the biggest thing that he can do. Recently, I was perusing some sermons preached by my great-grandfather, Herman Ulysses Davis. He was born in Beaver County, Pennsylvania in, in the 1870s. He attended Grove City College and Western Seminary before becoming a Presbyterian minister in 1898. He subsequently served six pastorates in Western Pennsylvania. In one sermon preached in 1916, he asks, what is the biggest thing you can do for Jesus? Young man, what are you going to do with your life? Well, I'm going to be a farmer. I'll stay at home and make a living off the farm. My father needs me. Okay, in other words, you are going to follow the line of least resistance. You are going to slide through this world as easily as you can. Now, that may be the biggest thing you can do for Jesus Christ. And if it is, do it. But if there is a bigger thing you can do for Jesus, do it. Ah, uh, young, young woman, young woman, how are you going to invest your life? Well, I will stay at home and live my life in a quiet way and perhaps get married and spend my days in establishing a home. Very well, perhaps you are going to teach school for a few years and then settle down to a quiet home life. Well, that is commendable. But the question now is, is that the biggest thing you can do for Jesus or with the start you have? The most important decision we are called on to make in this life is that of the investment of our life for Christ, to do the biggest, biggest work we can for him. So. What is the biggest thing that you can do? What kind of pledge of self or resources will demonstrate your willingness to reach big for God? Next week, you will be asked to return a pledge card for financial giving and an opportunity to commit yourself to greater discipleship. Even right now, today, you already have an opportunity to prepare yourself for the commitment you will make. You have a charge, and that is to pray. For this church to seize the many opportunities of ministry that present themselves right now, we all need to reach big. So pray. Encounter Jesus, like Zacchaeus did. Look into the eyes of love, 
that recognize you for who and whose you are. And then ask in God's presence, what is the biggest thing that I can do? Then do it. But be warned. When we ask big questions, when we have a room with a view, we see more than we were expecting. It isn't just the ability to do something big that Zacchaeus recognizes. He also sees how he is connected to others, how his life is intertwined with his neighbors. Now, admittedly, we sometimes like our lives separated into neat, careful packages, little boxes, or like food on a child's plate where nothing ever touches. But the view from up high teaches us that separation from each other is pure illusion. We know this at a variety of levels. Experience in planes tells us how small and close everything appears from above. Contemporary physics tells us that when a butterfly flaps its wings over the Pacific Ocean, winds are affected in Africa. Psychology informs us that family patterns and tendencies appear generation after generation. Theologically, we talk about being held together in God, of people from every time and place gathering around the throne of God and singing praises. We call this the communion of saints. Presbyterian writer Kathleen Norris offers this explanation. I find it a blessing, she says, to invoke the saints who have formed me, a beloved grandmother, or St. Paul, or John Calvin, or St. Teresa of Lisieux. I am blessed to be able to enjoy the worshiping assembly of any Christian church as including both those present and absent, both the living and the dead. When I come to the end of the Apostles' Creed, they are all there in the line, I believe in the communion of saints. Those who have helped me to be, and those who have helped to bring me to this place of song and story, worship and praise, are all there. Last Friday was All Saints Day, which we are observing this morning. On All Saints Day, we remember particularly with more intention than usual, those who have gone on before us particularly those who helped to form us in the faith or gave us their lives and gave us our lives, and those who have died that we might inherit faith. On All Saints Day, we have a room with a view, a very, very wide view that extends to all the company of heaven and the saints on earth. As we throw open the shutters from our room and gaze upon the view, we see the whole creation surrounding the throne of God and people from every time and place worshiping together. And we know that salvation has come, for we are all children of Abraham. We are now going to mark the passage of certain of those children of Abraham, certain saints from this congregation who died in the last year. And I will also give you an opportunity to name aloud anyone else you wish to remember. Rob Lawson. Jean Hill. Jody Dean, Edie Buck, Joe Chocolates, Jean Noto,
and others near and dear to our hearts, including Ken Masker's grandmother, Georgia Crisp's brother, Georgia Stevens' father, and others that you may allow for in your hearts. Let us pray. Gracious God, before you are all the saints of heaven and earth, and we are held in your hand, so we are still very connected to those we love. We thank you that in you love never ends, and neither does life. So we go on being connected. We thank you for this Sunday, where we have a wide view, and we understand a little more of our connection. We thank you for the meal that we will celebrate in which we will taste and feel and see that connection made real. And we thank you that you hold us and our loved ones close and in eternity. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.